So what we're going to look at now um, is the beginning of tetrapod origins. So for the vertebrates, all right, we had um, the development of all the chordate characteristics first, and then a cranium, right? So the cranium was the, the feature shared by all of the members, but most of them have vertebra. That's where, kind of where the name comes from. And we looked at the evolution of a jaw and bone uh, development a little bit, uh, and we got into the you know the jawless fish, and then a little bit into uh, fish and bone development. So now what we're going to do is take kind of the next step, and as we said, some of those fish uh, will start to develop fins, and those fins will start to develop into our limbs. All right, so our arms and legs are going to be homologous to those structures. So. structures that we're going to talk about are, we said, homologous. That means they share uh, an evolutionary um, ancestry. So one bone uh, is found in a whole bunch of different organisms, uh, and it's the same bone. It's just kind of different shaped uh, and may even have you know very different functions, but it is essentially the same bone uh, within them. Other organisms have what are called analogous features, which are features that look very much the same, yet they evolved completely independent of one another, right? So that would be analogous. But we're talking about structures that are homologous, right? That do share the ancestry. So we had the, you know, the, the ray-finned fish, or a group um, that had, we said, bone. Uh, get a little couple little structures here for them. And then they have these fins. And inside the fin, they're mostly ray fins, so there's these little spines and, and bone structures, so mostly a lot of these long spines, um, and very little um, bone throughout that is actually uh, homologous to our limbs. However, some other groups of fish start to develop more bones here at the base of some of these structures. Right, so these are still... Um, bony fish, but what they start to develop are these, so these, and they still look like they have these rayed fins, but within little lobes, muscular lobes along uh, the animal's body as part of their appendicular skeleton, they start to develop the bones, the bones that are part of our uh, shoulder and hip girdle, sorry, is what we're called. Uh, now we'll go into that a little bit later. We'll talk about the details of all of those bones. Right now we're just kind of focusing really on um, the forward, you know, the, the appendages of our arms. That, that's kind of what these uh, structures are gonna be about, not necessarily the leg structures. Very similar, um, different bones. And we have uh, a lot of the looks, looking at gene expression, um, specific fossil record, uh, and living organisms today, which are the lobe-finned fish, that have these structures. So what I have drawn uh, here uh, are some, these are organisms that are extinct, and these are the, the genus of the organism, uh, the Tictilic and the Acanthostega. And what we see in these structures are, uh, and then here's a coelacanth, uh, which is fairly um, not all that well, you know, developed. Uh, so even though we have members of this alive today, they are more ancestral. So they're further back. They're not uh, quite as far along because uh, the these organisms they became extinct eventually gave rise to ancestors of the amphibia, which is also what we're going to cover a little bit today. So. Let's look at some bones first, look at a little comparison about them, uh, and then we're going to kind of just move over into the, the amphibia and continue along with that. So in our arms, our upper arm bone uh, is called the humerus. And that's the uh, Tictelic has that, the Acanthostega has that, even the Coelacanth, they have the, acanth they have the uh, humerus and it is a homologous structure. We have here, then in the blue, is the radius, and the green is the ulna. Now, there's a bunch of other bones here. Um, you can see actually fairly well 
um, defined bones, where as here in the in the in the tictalic and the acanthostega less, and then I, I kind of got cut off really in room for the the coelacanth, but even far less uh, organization um, of a wrist structure uh, and the phalanges, you know, or digits. So that's what the really the key uh, evolutionary significance of this particular uh, fossil organism is is that we have the uh, beginnings of the ulnary and um, the bones that would give rise to, so the wrist and hand bones, you know, essentially, uh, start to become much more defined in this particular organism, this particular uh, ancestor. So we have you know, evidence of organisms that go from the, the ray fins to having some of, of the same bones that we do, but still pretty much having sort of ray-like fins, mostly for swimming. What would be the selection pressure you know, for this? Well, one would be you know, exploiting you know, different habitats uh, to find different types of food, or if there was competition for food, uh, to again move into different areas where there was, were less competition. Another idea uh, on this is that you know, what people have proposed was that organisms were living in shallower waters, and as the areas would dry up at some points in time, the organisms would die because they couldn't get back to water or they were trapped in little pools. Organisms that had more muscular fins and were able to kind of crawl somewhat on land would then be selected for. They would have an advantage. Uh, and then little by little over time, the, you know, those organisms would become you know, more successful. They would be able to exploit land environments. They would also need to, though, have an ability to gain oxygen, right? which is also where you know, some of the, the lobe-finned fish, some of them also share a characteristic or trait. Uh, there's another group of organisms related to them. It's a different group called the lungfish. And so the lungfish then start to develop the beginnings of a lung structure. And then that's kind of a little bit what we're going to talk about with when we go into the amphibia, uh, because the amphibians have a life cycle that is partly aquatic. Uh, it, they have gills and they get their oxygen from the water. And then most of them undergo a metamorphosis where they lose the gills and then they develop lungs and then they become terrestrial and they get their oxygen from the air. And so within this organism's life cycle, they have both the completely aquatic and the terrestrial versions. And so that's of our idea on the evolution of these organisms that exploited terrestrial habitats, that they developed limbs and the ability to get air pretty much at the same time. They would need to do this, um, although organisms uh, in the ocean could still develop these limbs for crawling and walking, but really swimming would be far more effective and efficient for most of the, their strategies, uh, except for specialists who might be like a hide and wait predator who just kind of like sits on the bottom, doesn't really swim around or move, and they might lunge for a uh, particular prey. So this is just a little overview to give you a comparison of um, relationships between some of these bones. But the main thing to take away from is just the names. I want you to take away the, the humerus is the upper arm bone and the two lower arm bones are the, the radius and the ulna. And those are the structures that are homologous that we would look for as we looked in the fossil record and we, as we could compare other organisms. And as we look at the rest of the vertebrates, they're all going to be now, you know, have cranium and vertebrae. They're all going to have a jaw, they're nathostomes, right? And they're going to be tetrapods and they're going to have limbs. Right? And then we're going to still add a couple more features to kind of further separate and divide them apart. So that's kind of the little introduction here and the talk about the, the limbs themselves. Now we're going to look at uh, a group, really our first group of organisms that we have you know, today that has the well-developed limbs or essentially it would be what these organisms gave rise to. As they became extinct, they gave rise to an ancestor who became what we call today uh, the amphibia. All right, so amphibia is a class of vertebrate. Uh, and they're a class of vertebrate that, you know, with this name amphibious uh, means kind of water and land, right? And that's displayed with their life cycle. So they reproduce in water. Now, some of them can reproduce away from bodies of water, but they still need water uh, for reproduction. So they might reproduce, say, these little small frogs might reproduce inside flowers in a rainforest, and then the flowers uh, or parts of the plant, the leaves of the plant, may collect water and form like a little mini 
miniature aquarium, you know, inside the uh, leaves themselves. And so it's inside that environment that then they reproduce. And so we would have eggs. And typically we have external fertilization. And then we start to develop an embryo. Now this egg has a gelatinous coat around it. It does not have a hard shell. So there is no shell. And if the egg is taken out of the water, it will dry out and then the organism will die. So they have to develop in water. So they need to be in a pond or a lake um, or like a, a some kind of collected uh, puddle of water in associated with some other organism, but they have to be um, in water to develop. As they develop, and this is, goes, is true for pretty much all the members of the group, especially the ones that we're going to focus on, um, that you're most familiar with. And I'll talk about some of these others uh, here that you're not familiar with. Um, so they, they'll develop gills and a tail. So remember, these are some of the chordate, common chordate characteristics as well. Um, they have the pharyngeal gill slits. Uh, they had a notochord at some point in time, and then it was rearranged into their vertebrae. Uh, they have the tail, the postanal tail, and the pharyngeal gill slit. So they have these characteristics. Now, over time, what starts to happen, and this is going to now be different in the different groups of amphibia, is that generally limbs will start to develop. And, and typically the hind limbs, which would be like our legs, develop first. So the organism still has a tail and has these little hind limbs, and they're mostly swimming around. Um, but they can start to use the limbs so they have bone development and muscular development. The other thing to talk about just a little bit then in relation to you know, the ancestral organisms that start to develop these same bones uh, is the look at you know, musculature you know, as well. So muscle had to develop at the same time that the bone developed so that they could actually then use these structures. What we have found today as well is that among different organisms, uh, gene expression. So certain genes being present in different groups of organisms and those same exact genes control appendages. And so eventually as we get to some of the other um, tetrapod vertebrates, we'll compare, we'll continue to compare these appendages. This isn't the last time you're going to see this uh, information. It's going to kind of come back again in another uh, lecture as we compare, say, the limbs of a, a whale to a human to a bat. Right? And so say one is used for swimming. This is ours, used for a whole variety of different things, and um, the other is used for flying, and which bones are actually used in those cases, even a bird wing versus a bat wing. And what do we have there? So the bird is mostly the arm bones, whereas the bat actually, uh, its wing is actually more um, hand bones, all right, into the wing. So we'll kind of look at, you know, which of these bones get rearranged uh, into other structures. And there, but the point is that I was bringing up is that they're the same genes that express these structures among all those organisms. They just get expressed in different sorts of ways. Uh, and so the hind limbs get triggered to be developed first. So this would be a, a genetic trigger. They develop, uh, and then the organism uh, gets a little bit larger. The other thing that's going to start to happen at this point, now this is going to differ for different groups. In our example here, this is an example for, you can see it's like a little frog. So we'll now talk about the subgroups or orders of amphibia. You're not going to have to know like specific names of the orders, but you kind of know should know the, the overview of this. So within the amphibia, the class amphibia, there are generally three main orders. All right, the orders are Gymnophiona, Caudata, and Inura. The Gymnophiona are legless, which you're going to find, you know, that's weird, right? Because the whole thing we're starting to talk about right now are limbs and limb development in tetrapods and here's a group that doesn't even have have them except they their ancestors had them uh they have the some of them have the, the rudimentary development of some of these structures but they just don't continue to develop same with snakes they're a different group um they're in within with the reptiles snakes we think of as you know they're being reptiles without legs they're still tetrapods so you're like what how is that because again ancestrally they had that group some snakes actually develop the rudiments of the shoulder, the, uh, the pectoral and the pelvic girdles, um, but they don't continue to develop the appendages. And some of them don't develop those things at all. Just the same way with us. Some people you know, develop wisdom teeth and have to have the wisdom teeth removed. Other people never actually develop their wisdom teeth, so that doesn't, doesn't get expressed. But ancestrally, you know, we, you have those teeth or, other, or your ancestors have those, those teeth. Same thing with the appendages. So these gymnophiona are a group of sort of 
Some people think them as they're worms. Some people think they're snakes, but they're actually a type of an amphibian um, that typically lives in burrows and in soil. Um, and uh, we're not going to really talk too much about them because again, we're focused on the on the legs. But they're sort of their own branch of amphibia. So then we have the anura and caudata, and they're going to have a couple key uh, differences. So generally, we refer to these as the frogs, and these the salamanders. and a newt, a blunt group, and there's some slight differences between um, salamanders uh, and newts, but they're, as far as what we're going to discuss generally, they have the, the same features. Now, in the anura, or the group of the frogs, what starts to happen is, now as their four limbs start to develop, so we have hind limbs and four limbs, and so these are the limbs that we're talking about over here, with the humerus, the upper arm bone, uh, the ulna and radius, and then wrist bones and fingers uh, and, and the digits and so forth. The tail starts to recede. So it's reabsorbed. Uh, so even the, you know, the vertebrae get kind of fused in and reduced. Uh, and then the tissue there is uh, has specific cells that come in and then break down that tissue and then, and then reabsorb uh, the nutrients and material. And so frogs don't have tails, right? So the anura are tailless, whereas the caudata, this doesn't happen. In the caudata and the salamanders, they start to develop the limbs, but their tail does not recede. So that's one of the, sort of the main main differences there. Um, but they uh, and they, they keep the tail as an adult. So so one difference between these two groups would be frogs lose the tail, uh, salamanders keep the tail. So number one here we're talking about is the, the tail. The second thing that's a different uh, between frogs and salamanders are the, lim is the, are the limbs themselves all right, and how they develop. Frogs, which are fairly well known for jumping, they have extremely powerful and large hind limbs. All right, so the bones there are uh, very well developed and the, and the muscle is especially well developed, whereas the forelimbs are very small. So, large hind limbs. For salamanders and newts, our caudata group, the hind limbs and forelimbs are pretty much the same. So, so the same size, same musculature, obviously different, slightly different bones, um, but basically a similar arrangement. So uh, same size uh, four and hind limbs. And there are a number of other sorts of differences, but those are kind of two very obvious and major differences that we see both in the development uh, and then as adults uh, for the two main or major groups of amphibians. Uh, and that kind of again, again relates to the you know, evolution of the groups uh, and other groups that we're going to talk about you know, after them. One of the key things to keep in mind is with the amphibia is that they're tied to water, right? Because the egg is laid in the water, the fertilization is external, and the embryo develops without any kind of shell or protective covering, that uh, this new aquatic swimming uh, sort of larval form, our tadpole larvae, uh, needs water, right? Uh, or else it will die. They can't live or survive on land. So we kind of see the aquatic ancestry away and, and then the um, terrestrial habit in the same group. Uh, and that kind of echoes of their uh, evolutionary ancestry as well. Uh, amphibians, as far as their um, feeding strategies, are, are highly varied. A number of them are, are predators on other animals. Um, so they'll eat a variety of things from uh, aquatic ones might eat more uh, crustacea or they might eat insects and insect uh, larvae. Some of them will eat annelids, uh, worms from the soils uh, and, and a whole variety of different organisms. But they're primarily um, eating other animals. They're primarily carnivores or eat, eating uh, other things, generally not um, herbivores. Their tooth development is different. They don't really have uh, teeth in jaws, so they do have jaws as well. But their teeth, if they have them, uh, are of a different sort of origin. Uh, they're more of an epidermal uh, origin than of a, a bone-based uh, origin. 
Uh, and that's going to be, you know, the, just a, the overview of this particular group. So our next step in, in the evolution here, as we talked about, you know, jaw, uh, the appendicular skeleton and, and bone development. This is kind of our, our next look. What comes after this is sort of a break from the water. So the idea here, if we're looking kind of a, the big picture, is movement from an aquatic form onto land. All right. So we have our fish, which are completely aquatic, all aquatic throughout their whole lives. We have organisms that are aquatic at some time in their life and then become terrestrial. And then we'll have organisms that are completely terrestrial and they break their tie to the water. And that's our next step. So that would be like the next look at the lecture. And that would be the amniotes. And our focus in there will be on the amniotic egg itself. So how the egg is produced and all the rest of the groups are going to have an amniotic egg. So we'll look at the reptiles, birds, and mammals uh, as those uh, final groups. And between them, we'll come back and compare some of these uh, structures as well.